Hi friends, welcome back to our reading of Categories and Sheaves. It's been a minute, and for that, uh, well, I owe you guys a little bit of an apology. I'm going to try to catch up to where we've been in Discord uh, in these notes. And it's sort of been very busy lately for me. So I apologize if these things have been coming out a little slower than we would like. Part of it is also that I found some of these sections to be kind of complicated in their own right. So maybe there's a silver lining to all of this, which is that that I'm making this video signifies that I finally feel like I sort of understand what's going on well enough to explain it to you all. Uh, so hopefully you guys find this stuff enlightening. So we're picking up where we left off. I know if you're following along online, you can just click from 2.5 to 2.6. Um, but if you're in the Discord, then it's been a minute since we've uh, since we've talked in this format. And we're starting section 2.6. And 2.6 and 2.7 really go hand in hand. And these are about the notions of indolim and prolim. And I'm going to start before I just jump in. I know oftentimes with these sections, we like to just jump in um, and give the definitions. But I want to start with a little bit of philosophy um, because these are sort of unusual objects. And I, I really grappled with this for a while. So the, I want to start by sort of reminding us what the Yonita Lemma is telling us. We know that what it does is embed a category into its category of pre-sheaves as a full subcategory. And the idea is to sort of ambiguate between classical objects in a given category, which we might call C, and their images in the Yonita, under the Yonita embedding. Uh, often we call that gamma, so we want to sort of ambiguate between C and gamma of C for any, or sorry, uh, A maybe we'll call it, um, and gamma of A. And Kashiwar and Shapira have been doing this sort of thing off and on, where they even use some notation of this, where like they make this suggestive by writing A of B, where the idea being that I'm treating A as a functor. So what this is, is hom in the pre-sheaf category of BA, and they're stealing notation uh, or this is sort of reminiscent of, if you like, maybe not really stealing the notation, but maybe reminiscent of um, A to the B in set theory, right? Like this typically means something similar. It's all the maps from B to A. That would be in the category of sets. Um, and here this is happening on the level of pre-sheaves, but we're sort of stealing the idea. So then what are these guys in and pro? Well, um, there are some other categories that we're going to talk about in later chapters called end and pro categories. And these categories are obtained by sort of completing a category. Um, and completion here means something like in the sense of obtaining R from Q. Um, I think, in fact, that might even be precise um, in the sense that I can regard Q as a partially ordered set, which I can then give in turn as a category. And then I think it's the case that if I complete, you know, take the Cauchy completion of a post set, um, with its order topology, I think that's the same thing as taking the end limb um, uh, of the category abstractly. And what that means is then the completed objects should be defined in a way roughly analogous to the way Dedekind cuts are in R. Um, maybe I should be writing some of this down. So I have a completion of Q into R, which I'll just call, I'll just mark this as the Cauchy completion. And recall that uh, Dedekind cuts what those are. Well, these are subsets of R, or really maybe subsets of Q, sorry, which are rays. So in other words, they look something like this, you know, going out to infinity, and then there's um, some finite condition here, like for example, maybe x squared less than 2. And Dedekind and any course in real analysis goes to tremendous lengths to make this into a field and explain to you how all this works. Um, but the important thing here is this condition, which is that the object in the completion is specified by its relation to other objects, in particular relation to the classical or original objects. So in other words, it's the rational numbers less than two. Um, and we say that that set is how we think of the square root of two, according to Dedekind. Um, and we can play the same sort of game. Another familiar example you guys have seen probably 
uh, is what happens with vector spaces. Um, we know there's this uh, nice example of the category of vector spaces, um, of finite dimensional vector spaces. And this is nicer than the full category of vector spaces because the full category of vector spaces wants very bad to be topologized because infinite dimensional vector spaces are weird. But if I don't topolo uh, but even if I include the topology, then things are even weirder because then there's odd stuff like we've seen examples of vector spaces that uh, are not isomorphic to their double dual. They're just in sitting inside their double dual. Um, so this is a re but the finite dimensional case is a reasonable category. It's the one we're all familiar with from undergraduate linear algebra. On the other hand, if I take the completion of this, then what I do is I declare a new object or a generalized object or a completed object to be defined by its family of maps into it. I could also go out of it depending if I want in or pro. In or pro. And then the idea is that if I look at this uh, suitable equivalence classes of these objects, then what I obtain is equivalent to all vector spaces. And the idea here is that the maps in are sort of, you think of those as like picking out subspaces. So if I take all the maps out of finite dimensional vector spaces, then I can declare an infinite dimensional vector space to be defined by what subspaces it has. And then if those subspaces, um, if, if I pick out all of them, if I really do pick enough of them, then that will determine this vector space because I'll be able to sort of reconstruct the vector space using familiar linear algebra ideas, you know, pick a basis, define a linear map, extend it, yada, yada, um, until I get all the way to the whole vector space. So the idea is somehow that like end and pro limbs are all about the Oni dilemma, right? That's what I've taken away, what I'm trying to impart upon you guys here. That everything I'm about to say is secretly about the Anita Lemma. And that's why 2.6 and 2.7, I didn't um, I didn't put them out one by one, and I'm sort of doing them together because I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and really understanding the extent to which that is true, at least to the best of my ability as a non-category theorist. Um, and I want to sort of put this out as a package story. Um, so Let's maybe come down to earth a little bit. Here's another way of thinking about this that doesn't involve philosophizing about what's gonna happen in like chapter six, because that's when end and pro categories are gonna be introduced. Um, we sort of like when our limits and co-limits are sufficiently compatible with one another. Um, and much of what we're gonna do in the coming chapters are gonna be about proving compatibility results. And we know that when I have like a functor from a small category i into c, maybe a covariant functor just to make it easy, this has an inductive limit. And we saw a definition of the forward limit of alpha, which was that um, it's defined by the mapping formula, x goes to, it's done in the projective limit uh, in the category of uh, over here, and this will be alpha x, where we do this abusive notation and we identify X um, with its image under the UNITA embedding. Um, the catch though, and, and this is sort of where this stuff really matters, is that the UNITA embedding doesn't commute with injective limits. And so this version of limits, which is, uh, is not necessarily, um, how do I say this? Um, the, because the UNITA lemma doesn't, the UNITA embedding does not commute with limits, we're sort of motivated to ask for a kind of limit that is sort of the correct kind of limit on the level of pre-sheaves. Um, let me maybe illustrate what's going on really quickly with a simple, one more simple example, and then I promise we'll actually get to work. Um, let's take just groups, and uh, groups make it up for a nice category, and the, we understand the uh, UNITA embedding very clearly. Um, I, really, I feel like I didn't write very much in that block. I feel kind of silly, but that's okay. Um, So we know that a group is a category, and a group is a category with a one object uh, collection of objects, of course, and the morphisms um, are the group elements, which are all invertible. And the UNITA embedding 
uh, it sends us into set and it tells us the Cayley table. In other words, it tells us how the group elements actually permute one another. So what happens now with the Unita embedding versus um, a, a, a simple kind uh, of limit? Like we're going to take the co-product. I guess it's a co-limit, but uh, I have this bad habit of saying limit when I possibly mean co-limit. I'm going to try to be clear about that. Um, so let's just compare co-limit and Unita versus the other way around. So what happens if I take um, the co-limit of groups? Well, if I, if I take the simplest possible co-limit, just the co-product, that's just the direct sum. So the co-limit, well, if, if the groups are abelian. Um, if, the, if the groups are not abelian, you get the free product. So let's talk about that instead. Co-limits of groups are roughly free products. If you've ever seen um, the more general construction, like for um, for pushouts, then you, you've probably seen the amalgamated product, um, and there's even more general things in that. So I, I'm just going to say roughly free products, just because I want you to have in mind these simple examples. So if I take the Yonita, on the other hand, what, what, are, what do they look like in sets? Well, these are roughly unions. Maybe disjoint unions, you know, but more complicated unions. Um, I'm going to write disjoint TM um, because, you know, of course they might not be disjoint depending on, you know, what the co-limit is. But anyway, the idea then is if I take Yonita and I do it to groups, I do it to groups, and I acquire these sets given by the Cayley tables, the collections of bijections coming from the underlying group elements. If I take the co-limit of those, I get the union of those sets, the disjoint union of those sets. So this guy is the disjoint union of the Cayley tables, which I'm going to abbreviate as shorthand as just the symmetries. Um, we're going to think of those bijections as like symmetries, and I'm not going to think of them as Cayley tables. Whereas this other way is the uh, symmetries, so to speak, of a really huge monster object. Right, so if I'm representing these things by their Cayley graphs instead of their Cayley tables, then the co-limit of the Yonita guys looks like I take symmetries of one of their Cayley graphs and symmetries of one of the other ones, and that's a relatively tame object when the groups are pretty tame. But even when the groups are tame, if I take the co-limit first, I get this monster object, which is incredibly complicated. And then I look at the symmetries of it, and of course, that's also incredibly complicated. Um, and so these things in general are very different. Sort of illustrates this concept. Okay, so that's enough of a, a, a sort of warm up for where we're going and, and motivation for these concepts. Um, now I want to talk about notation for a little bit because Kashiwara and Shapira continue to give us this terrible notation. Um, so let me fix some new notation uh, and I'm going to continue to bear this burden of reading the notation in the text one way and then having to change it over for you guys. So you're welcome. Um, so first, what do Kashiwara and Shapira say? They use the symbol lim like this for what they call the ind and pro lim, um, which are, of course, the ind and the, the limits in the suitable category of pre sheaves, um, and also, of course, in the reverse direction. And this is sort of awful. Because first, whenever I read it, I'm inclined to like literally put the air quotes and it messes up my flow all the time because I think they're like being sarcastic or, or something, which is obviously not what's going on. Um, and they do the same thing for products and co-products. Um, I don't think I ever saw that notation appear in a way that was particularly distracting. So what we're going to do instead is use italics. Um, I'm going to use, or by it's, it would be italics if you're reading my notes. It's italics like in my stuff like this, uh, in my what am I saying, in my write-ups for these videos, um, but I'm going to use this notation instead. I think that's still particularly clear. It's not worse than my usual handwriting, and it doesn't look as absolutely awful as those quotes do, um, and hopefully you all find this to be agreeable. If for some reason I have to write a product, um, what I'll do is I will write the product, like the usual product symbol. I might not put the feet, but if I do, that's fine, and I will use uh, a sheaf marker like that or 
like that. Um, we'll, so we'll use these. And I don't think I need those last symbols. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it'll be okay. Okay, so I think now we've, that's everything I want to say about notation. Now let's sort of get started. So I told you what the ind and prolim are. They're the limits in the uh, suitable categories of uh, pre-sheaves and co-pre-sheaves. Um, feels weird. I still think co-pre-sheaves are a weird thing to say. Um, and off the bat, we have a couple of propositions. Uh, I won't phrase them as propositions because that sort of seems like overkill. We have some useful and familiar properties um, of limits and co-limits in this setting. So in particular, if alpha um, is a functor, and then we have beta i op, which will go into the uh, co pre sheaves. Then for any x uh, in C, then we have hum C hat. And in this argument, we'll put the forward limit. And then what does this become? It becomes the usual limit of the hums. And of course, this is the usual limit because hum of anything, this is all taking place in set. So on the right hand side, we have a limit in sets. Um, but on the left hand side, the internal limit, there is a limit of, she of sheaves, or pre sheaves rather. Um, and also, we have the analogous claim for the contravariant case, which is that limb, and here we'll put the arrow going this way, beta x is the same thing again. And this is a completely usual thing to verify. Like the, the verification works by just writing down how these functors actually work on objects. However, this is also important. So I'll put another exclamation point. And this is a point of confusion where I got stuck for a little while. These don't work when x is in uh, c hat in general. And in fact, that's even true um, even when the functors in question take their values among the usual objects instead of in the category of sheaves, or instead of like you know being general pre sheaves. Um, and I looked for a while for an example of this, um, and the best way for, to find one for me was to look at uh, actual pre sheaves, just because those are things that I can sort of visualize in my brain, so it sort of feels like less data. I've sort of gotten used to them. I apologize if there's a simpler example. Um, but let's just take a, a stab at that. If I have a category associated to a topological space, um, then the open sets in that category are the objects and the morphisms are the inclusions. And then a pre of sets is literally a pre of sets, like in the usual sense. I'm attaching a set to every open set. Um, there are a useful pair of pre to consider in such a category. The first is the um, constant pre -sheaf. with value a singleton. And the second thing I want you to consider um, is what they call a skyscraper sheaf. And for those of you who don't know, a skyscraper sheaf is defined to be, uh, I'll call it F, and the definition is F of U is a singleton whenever uh, I wrote if and only if, so I didn't need to use braces. So in order to make myself look better, um, I'm going to write when u contains a given point x, and it's the empty set when u is not containing x. So the idea here is basically, it's called a skyscraper because when we learn about stocks later on, um, this uh, sheaf will turn out to have a single non-zero stock. And if you already know what stocks are, then you understand this. Um, but it, it's sort of zero everywhere, except at that point where it's remembering that there's something there. So let's try to compare these pre-sheaves. Um, this guy, sheaf number one, the constant pre-sheaf, um, this is a very simple pre-sheaf for us to understand because it's actually the Yonida embedding of the empty set. Because, of course, uh, what are the hums in this, um, in this category? Well, hum uv among open sets is a singleton, or if you like, it's the inclusion, 
when that's possible. And it's the empty set when u is not a subset of v. And so then this constant presheaf is the Yonida embedding of the empty set. Because if u is the empty set, then the empty set is in fact a subset of everything. So this constant presheaf, it is a, a familiar object. It's the empty set, essentially. Whereas the skyscraper sheaf doesn't come from anything. Um, in fact, it's sort of defined in the opposite way, right? Um, the values that this thing takes, instead of sort of being inclusions, are coming from containments. Um, and as a consequence, this sort of thing is really different. And I, I, I sort of want to leave it to you guys to check this yourself. I don't want to go through it again. Um, but just to sort of convince yourself that it can't be true, um, just try it with like a really simple topological space. Like take a finite topological space, for example, um, and just convince yourself that, and again, you can use the co-product if you like, because it's a very, very simple, familiar kind of object to calculate with. Um, you can just convince yourself that in general, one of these objects tends to be a fair bit more complicated than the other. Um, in particular, the skyscraper sheep is the bad one because this is not the familiar object. So um, I'm going to leave this to you guys to do because I've already been talking for 20 minutes in what I hope would be a moderately short video. Um, but this is an enlightening exercise, or so I claim. Now, there's, it's not that bad. Um, if this seems like it's annoying to remember, um, this is the only annoying case um, because the familiar properties for projective limits are actually completely fine. They both work out. Um, in that setting, we have hum. Uh, in this, we have c hat. And remember, this is the contravariant argument. Hum. And of course, we also have the dual statement. Oh. Uh, I didn't write the limb, sorry. This should be sheafy limb. And here we have the ordinary limb. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, wrong gadget. Okay, now let's uh, formulate an actual proposition and see if we can prove something. I was once told that every good talk needs um, at least one joke and at least one proof, and preferably they're not the same. I don't know if you guys think that's funny or not, but I think it's funny. Okay, so let's let A be a pre-sheaf. Then the limit over, this is a particular kind of limit, these are the guys that map V to A in the category C A. And remember that that, la that last little bit is maybe a little bit redundant, but that category is the category of maps to A with commutative triangles. And then, so I claim that this limit exists in C hat, and we have a formula for it. And then uh, the limit, and I'm, I'm not going to write the subscript every time if I can help it. Oh, I guess I should write limit over all of V, shouldn't I? I should tell you what the limit actually is of. Uh, then the limit of V is actually isomorphic to A. And then two, uh, another, sorry, another part is if I is small um, and alpha I to C some functor, then if we set A to be the limit of the alphas, then the associated functor, we can call it alpha tilde, is cofinal. Okay, so the this is not particularly difficult, um, but it's sort of worth doing. The first claim is actually more or less even completely straightforward, or at least I, I'm pretty sure it is. Maybe there's something I don't understand, but I'll, I'll try. Um, you, you might recall that Kashiwara and Shapira have these functors that they call J, which are sort of forgetful functors. 
Um, and what J does is it is just C A to C, and it just sort of forgets the the so-called structure map, you know, the, the the map itself, and just returns the original objects and their morphisms. Um, and in view of these functors, this is the same thing as saying that A is isomorphic to the limit of the J's, of course, to A. And we know that for any pre-sheave B, we have a natural map, which we can write as com C hat A to B into the limit. And I'll, I'll write this just one more time for clarity's sake, like so. Um, but this guy is the same, again, it's the limit of the B of V's. And this map is, of course, a bijection because we're dealing with a natural transformation, essentially, a morphism of functors. So you just apply the unit dilemma. So the second part is at least a little bit non-trivial. So let's take a look at that part. Um, the Unita embedding gives us um, our functors HC. I called them gamma before because that's what Rotman does, which is where I first learned about the Unita embedding. But this sends us from CA into CA uh, hat. And um, one thing you might be concerned about is whether or not this is reasonable. Like, for example, is C hat A, is that the same thing? Is that C A hat or C hat A after I have used notation? Um, it, but it turns out that this is actually uh, not a question. And so if this is a little confusing to you, then you might go back to 1.4 or to our video on it. Um, and you recall that there's actually an equivalence of categories between these things. Um, okay, so now let's call this equivalence lambda. We're going to use this. We have a diagram that looks like so. I have my, my small category i and my associated functor alpha, which goes into ca. And then I have sort of two ways to think about how this works. I have c hat a, and I have c a hat. And here's our equivalence. And then I can map to C hat this way. And I don't need to, you know, worry about this because, like I said, this lambda is an equivalence. So these are sort of, um, I can think of that arrow as, that last arrow is going in from either one of them. Now, um, the, that makes these two maps essentially both the UNITA embedding. Um, the, the, the horizontal map and the diagonal map are essentially both the UNITA embedding. Now, the last horizontal map is, is our forgetful map. Um, and that thing commutes with small inductive limits sort of by staring at it. Um, maybe I'll label this guy um, J. Uh, it's J of that category and that object, but I'm not gonna label all that stuff. So what I'm just gonna say is uh, J commutes with small inductive limits. Um, and so what we see is that since uh, I want the sheathy limb, sorry. Since we have this isomorphism, it follows that if I compose with lambda inverse, I get a natural transformation to the identity. And of course, once I've done this, the important thing you notice is that the identity is the terminal object in this category uh, CA hat. CA hat, there we go. Um, and so that uh, what we get out of that is that the limit over the uh, elements of I of the pairs, because this is how we define um, elements of this category, this is just a singleton, but this is what it means to be co-final by what we did in the last time. 
in uh, 2.5 or 2. Point, yeah, 2.5. Whatever particular result we did that. Okay, um, let's comp let's do one more result and then let's call it uh, for this video, um, which compares the two different notions of limits. And while we're going to stop for this video, we're going to pick up like immediately where we left off with stuff about the Unita Lemma and the Unita Extension. So, so let I be small and alpha a functor. And now um, assume that the limit is isomorphic to an object of x. Uh, oh, I wrote, oh, to an object x. I said an object of x. Thought that was maybe a typo in my notes. Then, for any f, c to, I don't know, d, then the limit, the usual limit, of f composed with alpha is the same or isomorphic to f of x. And for this, we introduce the sheaf hom. It's pre sheaf hom, but it's sheaf hom. Um, and I'm going to use the notation that Hartshorn uses because that's where I learned this uh, idea from. I mean, Kashiwara and Shapiro also introduced this terminology. This isn't like my proof of this fact, but I'm going to use my notation. So you see the theme here, like sheepy stuff gets italics. Just hum f of y z. So this is a sheaf. It's a hum, but it's a sheaf. It accepts an argument. This will be hum in d f of z y. So the important thing here is that you remember f is a functor, y is an object. And so this is a hum, but it's a hum which eats objects and returns usual hums. So it really is an honest to goodness pre sheaf. Um, okay, so with this notation, then, um, we see that it suffices to prove an isomorphism, lim hom d, f composed with alpha into y, hom d, f of x, y. And we need, uh, of course, this to be functorial. So what we're going to do is basically just calculate now. So we have the limb. So we start on the left. We have this hum. And of course, what is this? Well, this is the limit um, now of uh, the sheaf hums Fy. Um, I just, uh, wait, does that make sense? Something's not quite right here. I don't think that that makes sense. Let me just have a quick think. I want to make sure I didn't get confused here. I think I'm... Yeah, so um, what do I need to do here? I need, I have my eraser. I need the limit of the homs. This should be done in C hat. I, I need to turn this into something that I can do that she, uh, I can actually calculate with. Okay, I think this is what I want. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, that makes sense with what the next line in, in my notes are. So but now we should be able to keep going. We know from the proposition or the property established above that I can bring the limit inside the hum. And I get, a, it's a sheafy limit now, but that's okay. We also have a sheafy hum.
But now um, we know that this we uh, are assuming that this is the same thing as hum c hat of x. And now this is just by definition um, d fx y. And that's what we wanted to prove. This is sort of clearly functorial from how we set it up. Now, uh, one last remark before we call it for the day, which is as a corollary of this, um, what that tells us is that when basically whenever possible, the end limb and the usual limit are the same thing. Um, in other words, in our particular setup here, what we've proven is that the limit of alpha being isomorphic to x implies that the usual limit of alpha is also isomorphic to x. And again, this is essentially just Yonida um, because these things have isomorphic homs. Um, uh, but what we've proven here is, is in a sense uh, somewhat stronger, right? We're, we're really on the path towards uh, characterizing uh, these objects. And we're gonna do more of that in the next section. Okay, guys, um, in real time, I'm going to be right back to pick this up where we left off. But if you're watching online and you feel like you need a break, then I'll see you guys soon. Uh, so until the next time, take care.